to introduce your speaker, Alex Roth. Alex joined PDL in 2007 with a Master's in Mechanical Engineering from Manchester University. He's actually undertaken many of our most complex projects over the last 12 years and has progressed through the business to become our Engineering Director. Alex is a Chartered Engineer and a Fellow of the Institute of Mechanical Engineers and he sorry, supports continuing professional development of our team and the wider engineering community through mentoring and professional assessment and interview. Alex has been a focal point for the analysis of threaded components within PDL. Back in 2012, he developed analytical tools and techniques to support a joint requalification project with Statoil, FMC Technologies and Oil States, which are now obviously Equinor and Technip FMC, um, which have then been applied across multiple projects. But to come back up to today's focus, the equipment used in subsea well intervention is typically qualified to API 17G or ISO 13628-7. And in this webinar, Alex will endeavour to give you a clear and concise understanding of how to apply these codes to threaded connections and other complex geometries. Alex will be talking and taking over for the next 30 or 40 minutes, and thereafter, we'll have a few minutes to address some of the questions. So without further ado, over to Alex. Thank you, Michael. Um, so as Michael's already said today, we're going to talk a little bit around um, threaded connector assessment to API 17G or ISO 13628-7. So I guess the th first thing to note, the, the two codes mentioned are essentially the same. So throughout this presentation, when I refer to the code, it's fairly interchangeable, as in the content of those is the same. So just to give you an overview of what we're going to cover, um, we'll just briefly touch on connect the function and failure modes, um, have an overview of the approaches that we can use to determine structural capacity. Um, we'll spend a little bit more time looking at things that we need to consider when we're actually assessing the structural capacity. And then we'll move on to look at the application of the actual assessment criteria from the code. And also right at the end, we'll just have a, a quick um, review of validating actual results against test data. So the first thing to kind of cover is what, what is a connector? So the code actually gives us a, a definition for this. So it is a mechanical device used to connect adjacent components in the riser system to create a structural joint resisting applied loads and preventing leakage. So a connector can take various forms. Obviously today we're focusing on threaded connections. Equally, a lot of the techniques and approaches that we're gonna cover are perfectly applicable to more generic connectors or other novel connectors. Um, so when we talk around connectors and start talking about failure modes, there's obviously lots of different um, failure modes that can occur. Now today we're gonna focus on the more, the kind of ultimate collapse um, modes. So typically excessive yielding, defamation or sudden disengagement of threads, for example. We'll also look at some functionality around um, leakage and sealing but we aren't really gonna cover um, fracture mechanics or fatigue failure. They are all things that we can consider and have considered in the past, but just with the content we've got to get through today, um, we wouldn't really have time to cover all of those in the amount of detail it requires. So just moving on to think about determining the structural capacity um, and kind of what it is we're looking to, to understand, I guess, that, again, the requirement from the code is that the connection has a level of structural safety that's comparable to that of the connecting pipe or component. So ultimately what we're trying to do is prove out that any connection is at least as strong as the pipe. Um, and that then makes the kind of the more global assessment of the riser system a bit simpler as well. And when you're doing your, your global riser analysis, you're not worried about particular weak links in the system. You know that it's that pipe which is going to be limiting capacity. Um, so the code itself gives or mandates um, that you need to demonstrate sufficient strength by use of calculations or test. And it then gives us some different methods that we can look at. So these are quite helpfully collated in Annex D at the at the back of the code um, and lays things out quite clearly. There's also a, a section there around qualification testing in Annex I, but today we will focus on Annex D and its contents. So within Annex D, the, it gives us methods to determine structural capacity. Um, but when you kind of look at these, it, effectively the code says you, you need to do calculations and it explains that calculations are designed by formula or designed by analysis. But it then goes on to say that 
if you use a design by formula method, this should then be checked against a more refined method, e.g. design by analysis or testing. So you're kind of getting pushed towards a testing or a design by analysis, so finite element analysis route. Equally, if you go down a pure physical testing route, the code then again says that you need to do some calculations um, to back up those testing results. And again, when we then come back to calculations, we're kind of back to design by analysis. So it, the code itself does kind of mandate and push you towards doing FE. And also when, when you start to look at more complicated geometries like, like we're going to today, trying to assess those confidently and get reliable results from those using empirical formulas and things like that starts to become quite difficult. Um, so that, that's why you end up using FE. Now again, within the code, um, it gives us different levels of finite element analysis or methods that we can apply. So the simplest being elastic analysis, whereby we're just considering the stiffness of the material. We assume we don't account for any yield or anything in that material. It's just purely the Young's modulus we're looking at and the associated stresses. We then can move on to limit load analysis, whereby we account for the yield point of the material, but we don't actually account for any hardening of the material beyond that. Or we can move into kind of full elastic plastic analysis, whereby we're looking at um, the elastic behavior of the material up to yield. And then beyond that, we're accounting for the material hardening. Um, now, this, this again gives the most representative response. Um, and again, elastic plastic analysis is what the code recommends for components with complex geometry or complex loading. And a lot of what we're going to cover today or everything we're going to cover today is going to be elastic plastic analysis. Um, it's worth noting with the elastic analysis methods, what you need to do with that method is you then need to kind of categorize or you need to categorize your stresses afterwards. And that categorization of stresses, especially in more involved geometries, can become quite difficult and it, it's kind of open to interpretation. So it, again, it's kind of in some ways easier. The, the elastic plastic analysis may be a bit more time consuming to set up, but certainly the post-processing of it, it's a bit more clear in that what is a pass and what is a fail. Um, likewise, elastic analysis, you need to be slightly careful with in that it can give you non-conservative results in thick walled components. So once, once we understand what methods we should be using to determine the structural capacity, we need to think about what, what is it we're going to actually assess and what are we going to do with the capacities we get out. And what we're looking at here is effectively a resistance chart. We, we need to communicate what the capacity of the connection is. So that there's a few different ways this can be done, but the resistance charts is quite a common method. So the graph on your screen at the minute the two lines are representing different pressure conditions. So the blue line is zero internal pressure. The red line, in this case, we're saying it's 10 KSI, but it's an elevated pressure. And along the bottom axis, we have tension, and up the vertical axis, we have bending moment. And that's effectively give us an, giving us an envelope whereby any combination of load below those lines is safe for that condition. You also notice on the graph, there's, there's two additional points. Um, and what we always recommend is that when you're running through these assessments, it's kind of prudent to check some intermediary points. So just make sure that the curve we're getting out is conservative. Because again, if there's different failure modes going on in tension versus bending, the curves aren't always a straight line. So it's worth just double checking that and making sure you are conservative with your cur curves. So in order to establish those capacities, um, there's different approaches we can take as well within the analysis. So tensile capacity, base capacity, or internal pressure or external pressure, these are all symmetric loadings. So, so long as your geometry allows, you can treat those as 2D axis symmetric analyses. The, the big benefit there is they're less computationally expensive than a 3D analysis technique. Um, and those, those models are generally quite quick to solve and get some, some results out of. When we then start to think about bending capacities or combined loading, this is where um, you need to start thinking about 3D half symmetry models. Um, now, it is worth mentioning the code itself does currently allow you to effectively calculate a bending capacity based upon a tensile, tensile capacity. So it's called the equivalent effective tension method. Now, um, it's worth mentioning that this, this method should be treated with caution. Um, 
the assumption is that the failure mode and tension and bending is the same and therefore the load path is the same. Now this is when when you start looking at threaded connections and geometries where maybe there's not a lot of preload or things can move a bit under bending, this is where you can get quite a different load path and components. So we, we always mandate or suggest that you should be doing 3D analysis or certainly proving out that the 2D method is valid with at least one 3D model. Um, and so part of the reason for that is just some of the experiences we've had and seen. So the graph on the screen at the minute, the blue line shows you a calculated bending capacity based upon a 2D tensile um, result. And the, the red line is the actual capacity calculated in 3D. And you can see here, there's actually a very significant difference between those two results. And that difference is purely caused by um, increased disengagement of the teeth in bending. So like I say, the, the methods there, it, it is applicable in some cases, but just treat it with caution at times. Um, so we're going to move now just to talk on a little bit more about the kind of things that need to be considered when you're starting to set up your model and starting to kind of work towards getting your capacities. So obviously the geometry is a, a very significant part of the analysis and it, it needs quite a bit of thought as well. So you can see in here, which is, we're showing a 2D representation of the connector with our tooth profile model. Now, one, one thing that's worth mentioning is the effect of the helix angle. Now, generally, you, you wouldn't be too worried about modeling that. I and mean, it's certainly in the past where we have modeled helix angles within geometry models, we've not seen any significant impact on the, the capacity. So it's fair to treat your teeth as 2D features in the symmetric model or sets as annu of annular rings within your 3D analysis. So then, when you come to model the thread, typically you'll be modeling this in minimum metal, minimum, sorry, the minimum metal condition. Um, you also need to think about what's the minimum possible number of teeth you'd have engaged again because of the helix angle. Um, and the kind of standard things as well, corrosion limits and stuff like that. The other thing that's worth mentioning is typically on standard thread forms, the, the root radii of the thread isn't actually defined. So this is where it normally comes from effectively the size of the cutting tool that the, the manufacturer is using. So it's important to try and understand what that radii is likely to be. Now, when we're looking at pure structural capacity, um, that radii is going to not really play a part. But when you start to think about fatigue and also including the, the local criteria assessment that we'll come on to, that's where that radii can be a bit more significant. So certainly getting a handle on it from the beginning is is an important thing to do. Um, the other thing to think about with the geometry as well is, have you got any preload in your connection and do you need to include that in your analysis? So um, there's lots of different ways of including preload. You, you can use preload elements, which makes it very easy, but there are some drawbacks later on in, in the post-processing side of things. Or you can maybe model in some initial overlap in the geometry and solve that out in the first steps of the analysis to, to build the preload into the model. Um, Again, with all these things, you need to think about what's worst case. So it may be that maximum preloads worst case for certain assessment criteria, but a low preload is worst case for others. So again, it, it needs a little bit of thought. Um, and then we we'll move on to, to look at the materials. Now, um, typically the analysis software will be looking for a true stress, true strain curve. Now, these curves can be quite easily generated. Um, ASME 8, Div 2 within Annex 3D gives you some formulas to calculate these curves. Uh, one thing to note is that the curve should be capped off at the calculated true UTS of the material and then treated as perfectly plastic beyond that point. Um, another factor to consider when we talk around material is friction. And again, you need to think about what's worst case. Generally, a very low friction coefficient will be worst case. Occasionally, um, if you had a higher friction, that might actually affect the makeup procedure. So you just need to, again, bear in mind what impact friction could have, but typically um, a low friction coefficient is going to be worst case. So then moving on to kind of start setting up your geometry and meshing your geometry. Um, we're, we're looking at a 2D mesh on the screen at the minute. Now, as I mentioned, 2D analysis is relatively cheap in terms of computation time. So this is whereby you can afford to have quite a high mesh density um, within your model. Again, you can see there's a very well-structured mesh on the model. Now, 
this again is whereby spending the time at the 2D stage can really help you at the 3D stage, which we'll see in a second. But um, it also helps with kind of getting the contact set up and also post-processing the model. So again, we always take the time, would recommend you take the time to get a very well stru structured mesh on your model, because that'll help you in the future. Now, if we want to, to build a 3D model, if we just took this mesh and rotated it around 180 degrees, we'd end up with a huge analysis model, which is going to take a very long time to solve. So this is where, at this stage or before the stage, you really need to think about what is the right mesh density. So to do that, typically you'd run a mesh convergence study. So you can see on the screen here what, what we've done in this case is we've looked at the thread form we're examining. We've looked at a range of different mesh densities and we've ran just some simple, simple tensile loading in 2D to understand at what point do we get a consistent result against the mesh density. So that's what's plotted on this graph here. We have mesh density along the bottom axis, and then effectively our assessment criteria. So in this case, average total mechanical strain across a tooth. And you see, actually, in this case, we get a very, we get good convergence of the mesh from very early on. So a low mesh density is going to give us sufficient refinement in the results, and it's equally not going to take too long to solve the model. So what we then need to do is take this mesh density and apply it to a 3D model. So in this case, we, we're using a half symmetry model. And this is whereby having taken the time to set up a very structured mesh on the 2D model, making these changes to the mesh in this model is very quick to do. Um, it's all defined, there's some parameters you can change and, and you get your mesh. The other thing to note, the image on the right, is the, the biasing of the mesh isn't equal around the circumference. So we're biasing a lot of elements towards the tensile and compressive side of the connection to make sure we get refinement of results in those regions. But in other areas where we're not expecting as much to be going on, we can get away with a slightly coarser mesh. And this is all about getting an optimal model. Now, um, another really good check to do at this stage, once you've got your 3D model set up, is to run a, a tensile case on the model. So you've got your result from your 2D model, if you run your 3D model with the same loading, you can obviously check you get the same result out, and that gives you good confidence that the model's behaving correctly, the mesh density is correct, and you've got a, a robust model that's going to kind of give you the correct results when you start putting the more onus loading on in terms of bending and things like that. Um, the, the last few things to consider, or the considerations we're going to cover, are kind of more typical or fairly standard analysis type things. So boundary conditions. So obviously you need to make sure the boundary conditions you're applying to the model are representative and that you're not over constraining the model. Um, equally, the, the other thing you need to think about with your boundary conditions here is typically what, what we're trying to do is obviously find the capacity of the actual connection and also prove out that it's stronger than the pipe it's connected to. So it's quite easy if you're not careful um, and you just model your connection with the associated pipe connected to it, you'll pick up a failure of the pipe before the connection and you don't then really find out the true capacity of the connection. So in those cases, or before you run those analyses, you need to be thinking about what you can do to stop that from happening. So that may be applying elastic material properties to certain parts of the pipe. Again, making sure you're not over constraining um, the rest of the connection or maybe actually thickening the pipe and things like that so it's not uncommon when these connections are tested that thicker pipes welded to them to again make sure that the connection fails as opposed to the pipe um, and again when we talk about loading you need to make sure this goes on in a representative manner think about pressure application where's pressure going to act up to when you're considering seal regions and also when when you're applying bending loads and also tensile loads um, if you apply these loads with a displacement, so for tension, if you just apply an axial force, um, that's fine. The, the model is more robust. It will solve quicker. But obviously, when you come to then start incorporating pressure in combination with external tension, you need to have the correct end cap force on and then ramp that load up. So this is where using displacements sort of starts to become more difficult. And certainly in bending, you shouldn't be applying a rotation and a force, you need to be applying that rotation as a moment, because otherwise you will over constrain the model and potentially not get the correct or representative response. Um, and another thing just to mention is obviously contact. Um, when we start looking at threads, these, these models obviously have a lot of contact in there. 
Um, and the contact stiffness you apply is, is quite important. So again, we want to make sure we've got a sufficient contact stiffness that we're not getting excessive penetration in the model and we're getting the correct load path and model response. Equally, we don't have a contact that's stiffness which is so high that it makes the model incredibly difficult to converge. So there's a balance to be had there. Again, running contact stiffness sensitivity studies is sometimes a good thing to do to justify um, what level of contact stiffness you need in your model. So we're now at the point where hopefully we've got a, a good analysis model set up. We've thought about all the things we need to and, and we're starting to run the model and get some results out. So we then need to think about um, the assessment criteria. So there's three different criteria we really need to consider. So the first is the global criteria, or the global collapse criteria. Now, this actually comes from the section of Annex D where it talks around physical testing and it refers to a measured strain of 2%. Now, what that effectively means is a total mechanical principle strain of 2% anywhere within your model. And this again applies through sections. So we're looking for an average through a section. Now, we have seen some other people apply this in a, in a different way um, and whereby they're saying, oh, well, if we have a region where we couldn't apply a strain gauge, we can't measure the strain there. Therefore, it's not a valid region. Now, that's that's not, not the spirit of the code and certainly not the intention. It, it's certainly not a valid way to be applying it. We have a model that gives us all that data. We should be looking at all the sections in there and understanding at what point are we hitting that 2% limit. Um, there's also then a local failure criteria we need to look at. Now, this, this is predicting against the starting of cracks. Um, so this is a peak equivalent plastic strain anywhere within your model. And there's effectively a limit on that of either 10% or the minimum of a ratio of your yield to UTS with the formula given. Um, Again, the local failure criteria doesn't typically cause problems, but you do need to be careful with threaded models whereby you might start getting some quite peaky strains where edges are contacting and things like that. So there's, there is an element of judgment to be applied as to what a valid local failure is or isn't. And then finally, um, we need to think about functionality criteria. So the functionality criteria will be specific to the particular connection, but some fairly Gen generic ones will be around um, kind of sealing. So for metal to metal seals, that might be a contact pressure, making sure we're not going to get leakage. It could be loss of preload, or it could be clearances at elastomeric seals. It, they're quite wide and varied, but again, you need to think about what those limits are, what the functionality criteria could be for your connection. So we're just going to give Alex a moment to take a sip of water here. Um, and I'll just take the opportunity to thank those people who've already submitted questions. And just to remind people that if you do want to submit a, a query, just pop it in the questions box, as I mentioned at the start of the webinar, and the team here will field those and we'll see if we can get around to answering them at the end of the presentation. Thank you very much. Thanks, Michael. So we're, we're going to move on now just to look at how we actually apply those criteria to, to our model. Um, so um, it's worth mentioning the, the first thing uh, we'd recommend doing once you've got results out of your model is is effectively taking a step back and just doing some basic checks and some sanity checks that the model response looks sensible. So in this case, we're looking at an, it's an exaggerated deformation plot, but it helps you understand how things are displacing and the relationships between different components. And again, it, like I say, it just lets you see that the model appears to be behaving correctly. It seems sensible. Um, now the next thing we do in, in a similar vein is look at a load displacement curve. So again, here we're, we're looking at the axial displacement um, versus tension and looking at the shape of that curve and saying, does that look sensible? Does it seem reasonable? So in this case, for the, for the load path we have through the connection, we can see the elastic region, we see where things start to yield and bend a bit. The curve seems sensible. Um, it's worth mentioning on certain connections where you've maybe got... Um, like wedges or dogs, which are engaging to transfer load. These curves can take slightly funny shapes um, as different parts engage and the load paths effectively change and balance out. So it, again, it comes back to just spending the time to look at the response, marry that response up with the model and see if it looks sensible. It's also obviously a good way to get a really good understanding of what's actually going on with your connection and understand how it's working and behaving. So what, what we then do is start thinking about applying 
the different criteria to the model. So when, when we think about applying the global criteria, we need to think about, right, well, what regions do we need to apply it in? We don't want to apply it everywhere. So in this case, what, what we've done and a good way of doing this is we've got a plot of total mechanical strain here and we've capped the contours at a certain level. So in this case, we've capped the contours at 2%. Now, that, that's not us applying the limit, but that's allowing us to see in what regions are we seeing strains close to or in excess of 2%. So from looking at this, you can see straight away there's some regions on the nut and the load shoulder, but the thread itself doesn't actually look as though it's going to be a critical region. It doesn't really seem to be much elevated strain in there. So again, what, what you should be doing with all, all FE and all models is kind of trying to relate it back to some simple hand calc. So what we've done in this case is we've gone back and just we've compared, right, what's, what's the shear area on the load shoulder? How does that compare to the thread shear area? does it seem sensible that the model's failing in this region rather than the thread? And again, you can see by comparing the shear areas and things actually, yes, it is. You see there's a note in there, actually the shear path on the load shoulder surely gets smaller as you apply load. So yeah, it seems sensible. So we're then gonna take a much closer look at that region. And the next thing to do to apply that criteria is to apply some paths to the model. So you can see straight away on the load shoulder, there's a path, so path number one indicated and what, what you should be doing there is applying or calculating the average strain along the length of that path. And it's when that average strain hits 2% that, that you've hit, effectively hit the global criteria limit. So we can do that in that region. You see there's a couple of other regions as well we'd probably want to check. So across the smaller section of the nut and also shear through the top of the nut. So what we generally recommend you should do is extract those results for all of your load steps. And then what that means you can do again is plot a graph of how that strain is building in those critical regions and how that's affecting performance. Um, the other thing to, to think about as well is things like, again, functionality, but look at your tooth disengagement. So again, here you can see we've actually got a slightly unintuitive tooth disengagement in that some teeth are engaging more and others are disengaging. Um, now this again comes back to the way the model responds. When we look at the model response, we can see the top of the nut's rotating. So the threads at the top are disengaging, but actually the bottom of the nut's then getting pushed in. And that's why the threads towards the bottom are engaging more. So again, it's a, it seems sensible, but it's worth extracting this data to, to make sure. Now, what, what I'm mindful of is we've not actually looked at um, a connection where, where failure occurs in the thread. So, here we've got a different geometry. So right at the top of the screen is an axisymmetric model of, of a connection. And we're just looking in at different levels of detail until we've zoomed right in on the teeth. So you can see in this case, the teeth are very small. There's a lot of them. Um, so this is where, again, failure definitely occurs in the teeth. That's going to be our critical region. So we then need to think about how we post-process a thread as a whole rather than just a particular shoulder. So here, the, the techniques are effectively exactly the same. We're looking at the average strain through each tooth, but then calculating the average strain of all the teeth on the pin component, on the box component, or effectively the male and female thread. And when that average hits 2%, that's our global limit. Now, you can see in here, because there's a lot of threads with um, high strain, there may be other checks that come into play around functionality and being able to make up or break out the connector which means actually it's not the global criteria that becomes limiting, but for the global criteria, it's that average we look at. Now, another thing to mention when you are looking at um, threads and assessing them is that we can get kind of quite different responses and we need to consider that. We also need to kind of consider the, the volume of data as well. So in this particular case, we've actually got 44 teeth on the pin, 44 teeth on the box, and we've got about 28 load steps. So that gives us just shy of two and a half thousand shear paths we need to calculate the average on. And what, what makes that a little bit trickier is um, as we apply load to the connector that changes. So we can see if we look at the image on the left, the shear path effectively starts as you'd expect. It's a vertical path through the tooth. But as the load increases, it actually jumps to then be at a 45 degree angle as, as we're now shown on the right. And that's purely caused by the increase in disengagement. So you can see as the load goes on, the teeth slip over each other a bit more, the shear paths reduce in length. So again, this is where how you extract that data out of the analysis can be quite time consuming if you're not smart about it, because um, 
the position of the path on each tooth effectively changes every single load step. So this is where within the software, you are able to write macros and little scripts to automatically find these paths and automate that post-processing exercise. Again, if, if, if you don't do that, it becomes effectively impossible to post-process these analyses. The good thing is you do that once, and that's then applicable to all the load cases you're going to run, and it will also work or should work on your 3D model as well. Now, the good way of running through these checks is it allows you to build up a really good understanding of what's going on within your connection. So you, you can see here what, what we've actually got a graph is for a given load, the load distribution across all the teeth in the connection. And obviously, as we apply more load, we can see how that changes. So again, it comes back to using the analysis to get your capacity, but also get a really good understanding of what's going on within your component, how it's behaving. And obviously, that helps feed into um, future designs or optimization of your product by getting that increased understanding. But then um, when we're assessing threads effectively, we're then just plotting exactly the same we would as we would for any other component, plotting a graph of, in this case, tension against strain, um, throttle mechanical strain on the vertical axis, and pulling off where our capacity is. The, the technique in bending is exactly the same. We'll be extracting the, the strain from the teeth, typically on the plane of maximum bending. Uh, it's sometimes worth checking a little bit away from that plane that you have caught the worst case but then extracting that data across the load steps to get a plot of strain versus bending. Um, as I mentioned before, when you come to apply the local strain check, that's very straightforward. You just need to look at the plastic or mice's strain within your model and compare that against your limit and understand where you start to exceed that. Like I say, you, it's worth taking a little bit of care, just making sure that the peak strains you're getting out are true peak strains and they're not caused by any of the modeling techniques or anything like that. So, um, just lastly, the other thing we then need to think about is um, functional criteria. So, you can see here we've, we've got um, the jump we looked at earlier in tension. We've now got a 3D model of that in bending. And there's a couple of kind of quite interesting things here or, or things we need to be aware of. So, the first is the level of disengagement of the teeth. So, you can see here when we look at the top, the level of disengagement in the teeth is quite high, and certainly some of the teeth towards the bottom look as though they're close to, to disengaging or potentially jumping out. So this, again, is something we would never have picked up from the 2D model. We wouldn't have got that, um, and this does then effectively, to some degree, change a little bit how the connector responds. And you can see when we then plot tooth disengagement, the graph and the data we get out is significantly different to what we see from the 2D model, which again is what you'd expect. This is a connection with no preloading. It's a relatively loose thread. Um, so the, there is a reasonable amount of movement and that's exactly what we're seeing from the disengagement charts here. Um, the other thing to think about is effectively um, seals. So you can see in this region here where we have the seal groove, there's actually a reasonable gap opening up here. And what we need to be doing is extracting what that gap is, how that gap changes um, over time, and then effectively comparing that to allowable limits from the seal manufacturer or giving that data to the seal manufacturer to make sure that we're not going to have a problem with sealing. Um, so then um, the next thing to consider is... Um, We've got, we've effectively got our capacities out. We, we know what they are. We then need to apply design factors to them. So the, there's obviously different design factors for different um, operating conditions, which again they, they're given in the code. What you, you need to do is apply those to your calculated limits, and what you can then do is generate your capacity charts or your resistance charts. So in this case, we're now looking at a resistance chart for given operating pressure, but the different operating conditions. If you recall, the chart we looked at earlier was effectively for a, a single operating condition, but at different pressures. So again, you need to just think a little bit about how you present your data and make sure it's very clear what is presented on the chart so there's no, uh, nothing's open to interpretation. Um, and that's typically how we present the data. Like we mentioned, again, we might want to look at some intermediate points, so do that in the background just to make sure those curves are conservative. So just the, the last thing to touch on is um, what we term bridging analysis, or effectively comparing your calculated capacities with test capacities. Um, the first thing to kind of say is 
it, it should it should be treat, treated effectively as a different analysis. If you, if you think about all the things you go through and do to your analysis model or in your calculations, you're taking the minimums of everything. The reality is when you do a physical test, you, you're very unlikely to have that scenario. So what you need to probably be thinking about doing is going back and understanding what is the actual material data, what is the actual friction within the connection, uh, things like ceiling, number of teeth engaged, the actual physical geometry as well. Um, should be double checking that the actual test setup doesn't have any effects on your model, and if they do, they need to be like included. Um, and if you go through that process, it's possible to get very good correlation um, with tests. So we, we've had correlation in the past within one percent of test results, but it, like I say, it is a different analysis. The difference there between the actual minimum capacity to code to actual test capacities. No, well, in that case, or cases, it's in the region of 15 to 20%, which is all explainable, but you need to just be aware. So I think some of those people get a result from the capacity assessment. So that's miles away from test. It's really conservative or, or what have you. And yes, it is conservative. If you want to correlate with test, it, it's a different analysis. Um, but obviously the benefits of getting that correlation with test is it gives you the confidence in your result. You know how your connection behaves. So in the future, if you need to look at different conditions or consider different materials or things like that, you can do that with confidence that the model is representative and it, it potentially negates the need for testing or certainly uh, significantly reduces the amount of testing needed, which obviously can give really big cost saving and benefits. Um, the other thing that's worth mentioning as well, depending on the order of things, it's sometimes really useful to use your analysis results to help with the test setup, especially when it comes to things like strain gauge positions. So using the FE model to identify where we've got regions of elevated strain, ideally with small gradients across them that we can use to correlate, it's, it's, it's beneficial, it's worth, worth doing. So finally, just I'll just kind of summarize uh, very quickly what we've covered. So certainly our experiences and what the code says is for complex geometries, you should be using elastic plastic analysis. Um, the, the application of the assessment criteria, especially when we're talking about threads and things like that, needs to be done quite thoroughly and carefully. Um, and again, and this comes back to the disengagement um, of the threads and how shear paths can change. Um, again, when you're considering um, bending cases of threaded or complex geometries, would always recommend using 3D analysis. Um, again, we we personally would recommend performing some level of validation on your resistance charts by looking at some intermediate points. And again, when, when you then come back to compare with tests, you need to consider all those differences and understand and potentially look at doing a revised analysis to get a good correlation, because otherwise you're always going to have that gap and doubt about what's caused those differences. Thank you. That's brilliant. Thanks very much, Alex, for that. Um, so we've got through all of our technical content. We're going to now try and just address a few of the questions that have come in. Thanks for submitting so many questions, actually. This have been inundated is one way to describe it. So we're going to pick um, a few of these and then um, we'll see how we get on. So the, the, the first one for you, Alex, is a um, question that's come in asking about how to deal with non-axisymmetric features like small ports, cross drillings, that kind of thing. So um, I think, again, it, there's a lot of judgment to be applied in these cases. So typically small ports and cross drillings, so long as they're not taking away a significant amount of the cross-sectional area, they're going to have very little effect on your ultimate capacity. Um, if we're considering things like fatigue, they may become more significant. But for your ultimate capacity, they're going to have a small effect. Um, sometimes if there's concerns over those features, what you can do is potentially run a small sector model, run a tensile test on that, compare that to 2D axisymmetric and get confidence that way. Or there are other techniques whereby you can reduce the, the stiffness of the material in certain regions of your model mm. um, to account for those effects without explicitly having to model things. Again, the, the key here is trying to keep things as simple as possible in some respects mm -hmm. to get efficient models that don't take too long to solve. Right, I get you. Um... Okay, so another one, we, we actually a number of people asked the same sort of question. When, you know, early on in the presentation, you touched on the mesh convergence study, um, the sort of acceptable change, and it's probably a difficult question, but what, where do you have a limit personally? Or? I think there's lots of rules of thumbs out there. 
I think um, effectively what we need to be thinking is or understanding is the level of sensitivity of the capacity against that level of strain. So obviously when we looked at the curves before and how that strain changes against load, you can see as we start to kind of go plastic, it increases quite quickly. So that there's a balance there. Um, but a rule of thumb is kind of a less than a 10% change for doubling or half in your mesh size. That That's kind of an okay thing when you're considering elastic analysis. When we're looking at plastic analysis and explicitly using effectively a, a total strain result, you sometimes need to be a little bit more careful around that. So what we'd recommend doing is, as we showed, run the mesh convergence study, look at the gradient of those graphs versus mesh density, and also understand what sensitivity that would give you on your capacity curve and apply some judgment there. Um, so yeah. it's, the, the, it's quite and difficult, it's difficult because it? of how yeah. the variation within the geometries as well in criteria. Yeah, okay. Um, time for one last one. Um, there's a few questions about thermal aspects. Um, but this one was sort of just generally how thermal effects are incorporated in the model. So, like, I guess, that, is that like production fluid temperature, that kind of thing? Yeah, it, it can be. I mean, I guess um, the first thing you mentioned is obviously material properties should be derated for any temperature effects or to the rate of temperature of the component. So, and again, within the code, there's some factors to do that if, if you've not got those from anywhere else. Actual thermal effects on the geometries, again, we come into thinking about what's conservative because actually, if we have a threaded connection whereby the internal fluid gets or the internal bore gets hot, the outside's cold, applying thermal effects and thermal expansion can actually act to effectively increase engagement of teeth and things like that. Right. So th there's an argument to be had to say, actually, in some cases, applying those thermal effects is non-conservative. Mm -hmm. it, it comes back to doing a little bit of work or thinking about things at the beginning as to what are those effects going to be mm -hmm. and proving out that what you're doing is conservative or those effects are going to be trivial. I guess that's where with the analysis plan and method that we use, we kind of try and have all those questions at the front end and sort of agree with the client. And Yeah, I think yeah. that's certainly the approach we take is to, to think about up front. But I think for, I mean, everyone should be doing that regardless of mm -hmm. who they're doing the analysis for, if they're doing it internal, um, just really thinking about it. And that, that's a key to a lot of this is spending the time and effort up front to think about things before yeah. you dive into the analysis. Like, again, you, you just want to make sure you're not having to go back and rerun things because that's where Mm -hmm. it becomes time consuming yeah okay doke well so we're going to draw a line under the questions there just mindful of time moving on but please don't worry if you well we, there are quite a number of questions we have managed to get to today um but we will come back to you very quickly via email and, and answer questions and we can get into a discussion thereafter um so just to to finish off we um contact details are on the screen for alex and myself um the next webinar in the knowledge library series is scheduled for early 2020. The topic is still to be finalized, but it will form, follow a, a similar technical format. So I'm sure it'll be very, very interesting to everybody who's online today. So please keep a look out across the usual channels for details of that one. As a reminder as well, please also look out for a link to a recording of this webinar. Um, that should appear in your inbox and you should also get a PDF copy of the slides as well. So those are yours to keep and use um, as, as you like in the future. And please feel free to share those with your colleagues or any other interested parties as well. So really, that just leaves me with the final task of thanking Alex for sharing his knowledge today, to thank Kate and Linz for their work behind the scenes, and to thank you all for joining us today. Thank you.